Mr. Bradley, can you tell us a little bit about the Quonset Hut and how that came to be? Yes, sir. My brother Owen Bradley and I built our first studio at Second in Lindsley in 1952. And our second studio was in Hillsborough Village in 1954. And while we were at that location, a record producer from Deckard Records in New York that we'd been working for came to Owen and said, Owen, I'm going to take my business to Dallas, to Jim Beck's recording studio, and I want you to come with me. And Owen asked why he was leaving Nashville, and Paul said, Castle Studios charges me $5 a playback, and they don't have any echo, and I want some echo on my records. Owen had just built a new house. He was the leader of a 32-piece band on a radio show. He had a 12-piece dance band, and we'd been doing some recording sessions, so we thought we were doing pretty good. And Owen said, Paul, Harold and I built two studios. Let's build you a studio, and I won't have to move. I'll put up $15,000, you put up $15,000, and Harold will keep working for nothing. <laughs> and uh, Paul said, okay, I'll guarantee you 100 sessions a year. At, at, at that time, a three-hour session was only $100. The tape was $7.50, and it was $2 for a safety tape. And there was no mixing, there was no overdubbing. RCA built RCAB two years later, and all the other music businesses settled on 16th and 17th Avenue. And that was kind of the beginning of Music Row, Hal. Very good. Mr. Bradley was the head of the Musicians Union here in Nashville for a long time. He was also the head of the international version of the uh, Musicians Union. Can you tell us a little bit about that and why it's important? Well, uh, the, the Nashville Association of Musicians is over 110 years old. And it's one of 275 local unions that make up the American Federation of Musicians in the United States and Canada. And I was very privileged to have been the international vice president, the first officer elected from Nashville. Uh, and I held that office for over 10 years. And uh, the purpose of the union is to negotiate scale wages, benefits, and good working conditions for the musicians. Negotiations are by collective bargaining, which means the union meets with a prospective employer and exchanges proposals in order to reach an agreement. Sometimes you can do that in one day, and sometimes it takes years. Now, as the head of the Musicians Union, I understand you had an opportunity to travel to uh, Washington, D.C. and testify in front of Congress. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it's, it was my privilege to testify twice uh, in Washington on behalf of the artists whose recordings are played on XM and Sirius Radio. And uh, first you sit down with the lawyer in Washington and you write out a complete resume and uh, everything that you're going to say and you present it to the judges before you go there. Then you're there to present it in person. And you have to try to impress the three judges with your resume hoping that you can get their attention and keep their attention. And you talk about the creative process that the uh, musicians bring to a uh, demonstration recording that eventually results in a master recording. And uh, the judges are a tough audience, and you're really not sure that they're, they're with you because they are very solemn and they're kind of just uh, very unresponsive. So I found out the best... With, I found out the best way to finish my testimony and make my point was to play Willie Nelson's original demo of his song, Crazy, and then play Patsy Cline's version of Crazy. Now, I think we have both of those versions here. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get the Willie Nelson demo that they played in Congress. Crazy, crazy for feeling so lonely. So that's a demo that Willie put together. And then talk to us a little bit about the process from going from demo to the final production. We'll play the Patsy Cline version after that. Well, uh, if you listen to Willie's demo, uh, the uh, 
orchestra or the band and Willie are really not sure what the chords are, which is, <laughs> it's, it's all over the place. The bass notes all over the place. Uh, everybody's playing different chords. It's really rough. And then uh, when we went in to do Patsy, uh, we were just beginning to form the A-team. And we didn't have any headphones. We didn't have any music. And uh, a normal session is three hours long. But we went four hours long. And the reason was Patsy couldn't sing the song. She had been injured in an automobile wreck about a month before. And my brother said there was one note she couldn't hold out. So he kept working on it and working on the arrangement. He'd come out and he'd say, Floyd, play this. Da -da 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 -da. And we thought, oh, we got to play that, you know. And he kept changing the arrangement. And for four hours, we got to the end of four hours, and uh, he just made a track. We just did a musical track without any headphones. And we were lucky by that time. We were doing three track, and she was uh, in the middle, uh, able to be in the middle track later on. The band was split on left and right, and the voices, and had an open track. And uh, within two weeks, she came back and sang it in one take. He said, when she got through with it, neither one of us wanted to do it again. <laughs> Let's hear that Patsy Klein version. And that's Harold Bradley playing guitar. Crazy, I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. Hal, I, I might add that when I, we played those in their entire length up there, and when we got through, even the tone deaf judge from Alabama said, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Bradley, why are these why are these negotiations, why are these things important, what you do with the Musicians' Union? Well, th these laws uh, impact real lives. Uh, you have to have some order in business to uh, succeed. And we still have ongoing negotiations on behalf of pro professional musicians, including those who record music for sound recordings, film scores, video games, radio, television, symphonic orchestras. The career of a recording musician, myself excluded for some weird reason, is not that long. Your career is probably over at 45 or 50, and you're not trained to do anything else. So the recording musician must be compensated for their work, as their music makes millions for artists, record, record companies, radio stations, is played on television and the movies. But it's sad when you think of a guy like Stephen Foster, the composer who wrote Camtown Races, Beautiful Dreamer, My Old Kentucky Home, Genie with the Light Brown Hair, who died in the Bowery in New York City with 35 cents in his pocket and a note that said, Dear Hearts and Gentle People. Many people published and sold his music, but they never paid him anything. We've come a long way in getting proper payments for artists, songwriters, and musicians. We still have a long ways to go. Mr. Bradley, thank you so much for coming to be with us tonight. Thank you, Hal. A guy named Hal can't be all bad.